Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Owen O'Duffy and the International Brigades, Partisans, Part 5. This podcast returns to the series Partisans that started late last year. Created by myself and Stuart Redden, it tells the story of Irish experiences in the Spanish Civil War. Now this episode is a vivid account of the two groups of Irish people who travelled to Spain in late 1936 to fight in that war. These were the Irish Brigade, led by Owen O'Duffy, Ireland's most well-known fascist, and the International Brigades, who travelled to fight on the anti-fascist side. This will give you a sense why these people travelled to a country they knew little about to risk their lives, how they got there, and what their initial impressions of Spain were. The first four episodes of Partisans explain the background to the Spanish Civil War and Irish society at the time and I would recommend checking them out before listening to this episode. Part four in particular is definitely worth listening to first. Now this podcast is one of five that will be released in the next three weeks to conclude this series, Partisans, meaning there's going to be two shows out per week for the coming weeks. To make sure you don't miss out, subscribe to the Irish History Podcast now if you haven't done so already because the next episode will be available in a few days' time. These shows are going to total around 30,000 words of writing and have taken months to research and include never-before-published letters and accounts. I really want to take this opportunity to thank the show patrons who funded the research, the time and the resources that were required to make a series like this. If you enjoy this type of listener-supported history, you can support my work today with a monthly donation of your choosing at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. As a show patron, you'll get early access to the series. For example, part six of Partisans is already available for show patrons. As a patron, you'll also receive access to an exclusive weekly series as well. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Another great way to support the show is the shop, and lots of you will be interested in some of the new items available there, including flags from the Spanish Civil War, along with badges of Irish historical figures like Countess Markovich. You can check those out at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Now, research for this episode, as I said at the top of the show, was done by Stuart Redden. The narrations are by Aidan Crow and Wern Hogan. I'd also like to thank the Military Archives and the Archives of the Loretta Order in Dublin for accommodating the research for this episode. To begin, we start with the story of Consuelo Coughlin, an Irish nun in Seville and an eyewitness to the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. By 1936, the Irish nun, Consuelo Coughlin, had spent more than half her life in Spain. She had left her home in Bray in 1908 at the age of 18 and over the following three decades, she had risen through the ranks of the Loretta Order, becoming the local superior of a convent in the city of Seville. While she had slowly adapted to life in Spain, the heat of Seville summers could be unbearable. Thermometers registered temperatures into the high 30s, nearly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. To make matters worse, the city was over 50 kilometres inland, so there was a little wind in Seville to alleviate the intense summer heat, which was compounded by the fact that Sister Coughlin was obliged to wear a veil and a nun's habit. While summer, at the best of times, was a battle of endurance, in her three decades in Spain, Sister Coughlin had never experienced anything like the fateful summer of 1936. It was in the stifling heat of July that the Spanish Civil War broke out that year. Seville had been gripped by rising tension through mid-July. Rumours circulated that the army were about to rise in revolt to sweep the government aside and establish a dictatorship. All eyes in Seville were focused on General Quipo del Llano, the commander of the garrison in the city. Predicting how he would react had been difficult. While most army generals had fascist tendencies, del Llano was thought to be a republican in outlook, leaving most uncertain as to how he might react. If it were up to Sister Consuelo Coughlin, she would have urged him to support the other generals and seize control of Seville. For months she had been writing back to Ireland, talking about the emerging threat of communism and socialism in Spain. Churches had been attacked during left-wing demonstrations since they had won the elections in the previous February, and this had confirmed Sister Coughlin's worst fears about what lay ahead if something were not done. During what was a long 
hot, tense day of July the 18th, the answer finally came. While most had been oblivious to the fact General Cuipo Dagliano had actually been one of the main plotters behind the coup that started across Spain, and he gave the order for his soldiers to seize Seville. This would inevitably lead to conflict with the major trade unions in the city, and unfortunately for Sister Coughlin, her convent was located close to the army barracks in the city. The surrounding streets would soon become a battleground. Indeed, as the coup started, soldiers arrived at her convent door to take up positions on her balconies for the upcoming battle. While perhaps being nervous, Sister Consuelo Coughlin ultimately welcomed these developments, recalling these soldiers in a heroic fashion. She quoted one saying, This we only do for God and Spain, before urging the nuns to take cover. Not long afterwards, the firing began. Sister Coughlin later recalled how All of the terraces had been taken up by the military and further on by the enemy. When she says enemy, she's referring to the anti-fascist working class militias in the city. She continued, For more than 48 hours, we were in the midst of the fire. We seemed safe nowhere. We were caught in all directions. How the house stood against the bombardment, only God himself knows. Sleep was impossible. Every moment seemed like our last. All Sunday, the cannons roared and the sniping continued. In the following days of bitter fighting, the army successfully seized power in Seville and defeated attempts by anti-fascists to drive them back. While Sister Coughlin did not play a role in street fighting, she did play her own small part though. On July the 23rd, she wrote a lengthy letter back to her mother's superior in the Loretto Convent in Dublin, one of the numerous reports helping to influence opinion in Ireland. In what was a detailed account, she provided a highly selective version of events that had taken place in Seville. Understandably, she hated and feared Spanish socialists and communists due to their hatred of the church, and this had led her to sympathise with the fascists. However, the picture that she portrayed in her letter about events in Seville that she sent back to Ireland was misleading. She created an image of the Spanish army heroically saving Spain and Christianity. There was no mention, for example, of the reign of terror unfolding in the city after the army had seized power. Like they would in many cities, the army and fascist militias supporting them began a murderous campaign against their enemies. Trade unionists were massacred in the hundreds. While Sister Consuelo did make an oblique reference to this violence in the line No mercy is shown. This masked the fact that a bloodbath had taken place in working class neighbourhoods in Seville. Thousands would lose their lives, but Sister Coughlin made no mention of the fact at all. She, however, was by no means alone. Many Irish people would send similarly selective accounts back to Ireland, which would help how the war was reported, understood and most importantly how Irish people would react. Indeed, as Sister Coughlin's report arrived in Ireland a few weeks later, in August 1936, eyewitnesses were also making their way home. These included a Miss Curley, a native of Athrone, who had been working in Bilbao in the Basque country before she was evacuated in the days after the war started. She brought back news and accounts which portrayed the fascists as the saviours of Christian Spain and their anti-fascist enemies as marauding hordes bent on destroying Christianity where they found it. This account received widespread press coverage. Indeed, most Irish newspapers were deeply conservative and supported the fascists' attempt to seize power in Spain, and they embellished and enhanced the reports arriving back, blurring fact with wild speculation. When Mary Donnelly, the 26-year-old assistant to Leopold Kearney, the Irish ambassador in Spain, returned to Ireland and gave interviews, the Irish independent newspaper interspersed claims that priests and nuns were being arrested and executed side by side with the quotes from Donnelly. This left the reader with the impression that these were the words of Mary Donnelly herself. Irish newspapers had little knowledge and indeed less interest in the widespread systematic reign of terror being unleashed by the Spanish army in areas they had taken control of. There was the very occasional dissenting voice at the time. As covered in the last episode of Partisans, Pather O'Donnell, the well-known Irish Republican Socialist, who had witnessed the opening phase of the war, tried to give a different perspective. His view was in its own way selective, but this mattered little, given he was an increasingly marginalised figure in Irish life through the 1930s, and he would not be able to influence wider public opinion. 
It was accounts like those of Sister Consuelo Coughlin and the Miss Curley from Athlone that were far more influential. A one-dimensional understanding of the war that portrayed the Catholic Church as the victim saved by a fascist coup was emerging. This led to a very ugly and increasingly violent atmosphere in Ireland where the Catholic Church was almost totally dominant. Dissenting voices faced constant attack. Indeed, when Padre O'Donnell tried to defend the anti-fascist side, Dublin would prove a far more dangerous city than Barcelona had been even though he had witnessed the opening phase of a civil war there. He was attacked both figuratively and literally. In Dublin, what were criminal outfits known as the animal gangs spread rumours he had personally participated in church burnings. Inevitably, this led to O'Donnell being assaulted in Dublin. Later he explained how Irish society reacted to the news of the opening phase of the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War was indeed a rather one-sided fight. The issue was very simple. You were either in favour of burning churches and all that, or you were against burning churches and all that. In this atmosphere, Ireland itself was a powder keg waiting to explode, and the Spanish fascists were quick to exploit this. Within weeks of the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, the London-based Spanish aristocrat, Count Ramirez de Arellano, had identified Ireland as a potential source of support for the Spanish fascists. De Arellano was not only looking for money, but he also began to sound out the idea of raising a potential brigade of Irishmen to travel to fight in Spain. He approached the Archbishop of Armagh, Cardinal Joseph McCrory, asking for advice, and McCrory immediately identified a man that was, in his words, a chivalrous, courageous, upright man, and a good Catholic, and above all, a good organiser. Now, this man McCrory was talking about was General Owen O'Duffy, who was by 1936 a deeply controversial figure in Irish politics. O'Duffy had lived an extraordinary life. He had been a leading member of the IRA, briefly serving as its chief of staff. After independence, he had an illustrious career, serving as the commissioner of Angartha Siakana, the first Irish police force. However, by 1936, even though he was only in his mid-40s, every one of those years now showed on a face that was old beyond its years. His future, that had held out great promise in the 1920s, had been a grave disappointment. He had developed increasingly authoritarian tendencies and, in the early 1930s, had even contemplated the idea of establishing a dictatorship in Ireland. Failing to secure backing in this had resulted in him being effectively fired as the Commissioner of the Police in 1933. Unshackled from the constraints of officialdom, he began to drift rapidly towards the political far right as he embraced European fascism. He joined and quickly became the leader of an organisation called the Army Comrades Association, a right-wing paramilitary formation which was frequently involved in street battles with the IRA. Better known as the blue shirts from their paramilitary attire, they echoed Mussolini's black shirts and Hitler's Nazi brown shirts. However, initially at least, O'Duffy had remained a very influential figure in conservative circles in Irish society and had been appointed the first leader of a new political party, Fine Gael, which sought to unify various strands of conservative and right-wing organisations in Ireland, including O'Duffy's blue shirts. However, while most members of Fine Gael were deeply conservative, many found O'Duffy's rhetoric too extreme and divisive and within a matter of months he was sidelined by the party. Finding himself in a political wilderness, he developed a very serious drinking problem, something that would plague him in the coming years. As early as 1933, an Italian fascist had noted how O'Duffy often spoke under the influence of whiskey, while Irish military intelligence would later record a source saying he would knock you down to get in a bottle of brandy. By the mid-30s, O'Duffy had become a marginalised, embittered figure. He left the Fine Gael party, which he had once led in 1935, leading a small group of his blue shirts to form an explicitly fascist organisation, the National Corporate Party, who wore green shirts. In this period, his politics had become more bizarre. In 1935, he concocted a harebrained scheme to fight alongside Mussolini's fascists, then invading Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia and Eritrea, which came to nothing. When Cardinal McCrory identified him as the man to lead an Irish brigade to fight in the Spanish Civil War, this was a very risky choice. Now, if O'Duffy could recover the skills of his youth, he could be a very formidable figure. However, everything indicated those days were long gone. When O'Duffy was approached about the proposal, he immediately accepted and wrote a rallying call in several Irish newspapers on August 10, 1936, only three weeks after the start of the war. 
In this, he told readers of the newspaper. Conditions in Spain have reached a stage when it becomes necessary for the Christian nations of the world to take notice of the position. If that great Catholic people are to be saved from annihilation. It would appear that the conflict in Spain is not political. It is a life and death struggle for the faith on the one hand and the anti-God communism directed from Moscow on the other. It may be asked, how does this all concern Ireland? The answer is that it concerns the whole Christian world. Should we not at least break off diplomatic relation with the Spanish government until such time as the present tyranny is smitten down? Should we not go further and raise an Irish volunteer brigade for service in Spain? Now, to support this venture, he also launched a crusade fund. This call energised and excited thousands across right-wing and conservative circles in Ireland. It sparked a romantic notion of war in a far-off land, given references to the Crusades were common. However, while many in Irish society were enthused, it was immediately obvious Cardinal McRory had made a poor decision in suggesting Owen O'Duffy should lead this Irish brigade to Spain. Indeed, a day after issuing his call to arms, O'Duffy took the bizarre decision to travel to Holland for a holiday, removing himself from the picture for several weeks. This was alarming, given even the most basic of logistics had not yet been figured out. The very same day he left on holidays, Liam Walsh of O'Duffy's National Corporate Party was penning a letter highlighting that they still had no idea how the brigade would be paid or even how they would get to Spain. However, initially at least, O'Duffy's ineptitude was masked by a groundswell of public support for military intervention in Spain. Others, not least the Irish-American, Aileen O'Brien, who we met in episode 2 of the series, stepped into the breach. She had spent the last 18 months touring Ireland with an anti-communist exhibition and the outbreak of the war in Spain that appeared to pitch Christians against communists enthused her. O'Brien was a far more effective organiser than O'Duffy. While he was on holidays in Holland, she joined others on the far right of Irish politics to create something called the Irish Christian Front to rally support behind the cause of Spanish fascism. Others in this venture included the fascist and later Nazi sympathiser Alex McCabe and the anti-Semite James Belton. They called for a major demonstration in Dublin for the 30th of August, which was boosted by widespread and supportive press coverage. When Owen O'Duffy arrived back from his holidays at the end of August to start his preparations for his so-called crusade, Few seem to question his suitability. Indeed, in late August and early September 1936, Ireland was gripped by a war fever, almost as if the country itself had been attacked. While the Irish Christian Front drew a crowd of 15,000 to their demonstration in Dublin, this was followed up by an even larger rally of 40,000 people in Cork a few weeks later. The atmosphere at these rallies was toxic, although reflective of far-right politics. Speeches were extremely anti-Semitic. The amassed crowd in Cork were told how a gang of murderous Jews in Moscow were responsible for the Spanish Civil War. This was combining two conspiracy theories, one that claimed the Soviet Union was run by Jews and another that strangely claimed the Soviet Union had started the Spanish Civil War, even though, as we've seen, it was started by Spanish generals attempting a coup d'etat. However, as we have seen already, fact had no place in debates around the Spanish Civil War in Ireland. These rallies also heard falsified reports of atrocities claiming nuns had been crucified in Barcelona, which created a febrile atmosphere. At the edge of the demonstration in Cork, violence broke out and in the following days the police in Dublin contacted the Minister for Justice, warning him that it was very possible buildings of left-wing organisations in the city would be attacked at night. In this atmosphere, widespread support for Owen O'Duffy's Irish Brigade to fight in the Spanish Civil War was building. Thousands applied to participate. The Irish political police kept the Irish government abreast of these developments and they estimated 7,000 people had applied to join by early September 1936. They were drawn from several backgrounds. There were some, like O'Duffy and the Dubliner Gabriel Lee, who were explicitly fascist. However, the majority were not fascist, but instead motivated by religious reasons. Indeed, the common unifying thread for applicants was devout Catholicism and virulent anti-communism. Indeed, even some members of the IRA, who were one-time bitter enemies of Ono Duffy, applied to join. Naturally, it also attracted a fair share of adventurers, drawn by wanderlust and a romantic notion of war. While Ono Duffy and the far right had gotten off to a great start, on the other side of the political spectrum, anti-fascists and left-wing activists in Ireland didn't know what to do. 
The autumn of 1936 was a depressing time for those on the left of Irish society. While Pather O'Donnell had been enthusiastic about the anti-fascist cause and revolution in Spain, they received bad news when O'Donnell made a second visit to Spain in September 1936 and this time his report was far less inspiring. He had noticed that the revolutionary spirit which had helped defeat the uprising in many regions was already dissipating. He commented, The offensive spirit was almost dead and Bombas were making speeches full of thunderous they shall not pass. When he had visited Barcelona on his first visit, he had found the people there inspired by a revolution that had seen workers take control of factories. On his second visit, he found the situation in Madrid very different. I poked around through the streets, wandering aimlessly. Madrid did not give the impression of people set free, which Barcelona did. Indeed, in those early days, O'Donnell was very sceptical about the chances of an anti-fascist victory and was not in favour of Irish anti-fascists travelling to Spain to fight in a war he thought could not be won. Frank Ryan, who, like O'Donnell, had been a leading member of the IRA and was a very influential Irish Socialist Republican, held a similar view. He wrote to a friend in September 1936, I wouldn't go to Spain, nor to the US just now, because I feel I have to stand my ground here and rally our own. The frontline trenches of Spain are right here. In the following weeks, this attitude changed, however, What convinced Ryan and O'Donnell is unclear, but international developments undoubtedly had an impact. On September 18th, 1936, the Soviet Union decided it would not only logistically support the beleaguered Spanish Republic, but that it would start organising and recruiting volunteers for an international anti-fascist army that would travel to Spain to fight fascism. Known as the International Brigades, this seems to have been a game-changer for the likes of O'Donnell and Frank Ryan. With Soviet advisers and material, they may well have thought that this international army could swing the war back in favour of the anti-fascists. There is no question that the sobering reality of life in Ireland for left-wing activists also played a role. While Frank Ryan had claimed the front line of Spain was in Ireland for him, the reality was that socialists in Ireland were in no position to put up a fight of any kind. They could scarcely organise a meeting without facing attacks. By the end of 1936, Pather O'Donnell bleakly commented that they had essentially been denied free association by the far right. These factors combined to convince Irish socialists and republicans that they should join the international brigades. Bob Doyle, who we met earlier in the series, explained his motivations. I thought Ireland would go fascist, and that was one of the motivating factors in me making up my mind to go to Spain. I didn't know much about Spain, but I knew my thoughts were that every bullet I fired would be against the Dublin landlords and the capitalists. The idea that Spain was actually somewhere Irish socialists could find a struggle they might actually win was also attractive. Eugene Downey, an Irish communist who had also travelled to Spain, said the Spanish Civil War was a kind of lifeline for frustrated left-wingers. However, while thousands were showing an interest in fighting for fascism in Spain, the small, isolated, radical movement in Ireland could mobilise a few hundred at the very best. While both the Irish right and left started to make preparations to travel to Spain through the autumn of 1936, it began to look increasingly likely that the war might in fact be over before they even arrived. On Monday, October 26th, the Evening Echo, a Cork newspaper, carried the headline, The Fall of Madrid. The city was the Spanish capital and seat of the anti-fascist government and were it to fall, it would represent a major military and psychological blow. While the Evening Echo headline was somewhat premature, there was no doubt the situation was indeed grave for Spanish anti-fascists, not only in Madrid but across the country. Since the first week of the coup, the military situation had swung decisively in favour of the army and the fascists. When the dust had settled after the first chaotic days, it was clear the coup d'etat had failed in its immediate objective of seizing power. Indeed, anti-fascists still held around two-thirds of Spain and nearly all its major cities. Furthermore, the fascists initially at least faced serious logistical problems as their territory was separated into two unconnected regions, a large belt of land to the north of Madrid and another several hundred miles away along the south coast of Spain. However, despite this initial disadvantage, they had quickly evened the playing field. With the aid of Hitler and Mussolini, they had been able to airlift elite formations of the Spanish army from Morocco to their zone along the southern coast. These soldiers then began a major push north along the Portuguese border to link up with the other fascist zone north of Madrid. However, what caused most alarm for anti-fascists 
everywhere was the speed of this advance. The anti-fascist militias, which had been largely comprised of untrained workers, had fought well in cities they knew well, but they were no match for trained soldiers in open terrain and the more conventional battlefields where aeroplanes could be brought to bear. Pather O'Donnell, when on his second visit to Spain, had noted this. The war was not going well. The weakness was in the air. Our aviators just did not have a chance for their planes were completely outclassed. And the staff work at GHQ was very poor. The consequences of these air attacks could be terrifying. O'Donnell recalled how air raids, which were relatively new at the time, were undermining anti-fascist confidence. There can be no doubt that they were very effective in spreading terror. In a flash you realise something terrible was about to happen. Short, fast calls broke out all around and everyone to some degree found the same conflict within himself. Whether to stay still or dive for shelter or fly from one shelter to seek another. And then came a crash. A a loud, sharp, hard crack as the centre to an expanding noise not unlike the boom of a breaker on a beach. Second explosion, with no more idea of direction than maddened animals. People rushed out of doors, calling their calls which went beyond language. Why must there always be a touch of shame in seeing a blind instinct to escape death robbing a man of his dignity? To make matters worse, internal divisions were also opening up. While the anarchist CNT had led the fighting that had defeated the initial coup, they were watching their power being slowly eroded by Spain's small but influential communist party. The communists had focused their energies on influencing the Spanish government and in this they were increasingly able to punch far above their relatively small size, not least because the anti-fascist cause as a whole was dependent on weapons from the Soviet Union. This led to growing tension within the anti-fascist side. Now all these factors combined for a disastrous autumn in 1936. The Spanish Foreign Legion, led by an aggressive commander, Colonel Juan Yagüe, advanced at an alarming rate of 500 kilometres in just four weeks. It had only taken him a month to link up with the northern fascist zone, a move that left Madrid surrounded to the west and north. The fascists now turned their forces against the capital. The actual siege of the city did not begin until late October, but when it did, few held out hope the city could withstand the assault. By November the 4th, the fascists were predicting the city would fall within a week. Two days later, the anti-fascist government indicated they agreed with this assessment when they fled the capital and relocated to the safer port city of Valencia. On the same day, the Irish priest Alexander McCabe, the rector of the Irish College in Salamanca, where General Franco's fascist government was now based, ventured out to the front overlooking the Spanish capital. The fall of Madrid seemed imminent that night. Madrid was on fire. Shells and bombs were doing their work. Tonight, or tomorrow night, all Madrid will be a blazing furnace. Its palaces, museums, famous picture galleries, mansions, flats, warehouses, little shops and convents, all will be burnt out and disappear. The end of the siege and all of this madness will be the end of Madrid itself. It was blood-curdling, but fascinating to watch that red glow in the sky and these huge volumes of billowing smoke. Around the world, people awaited the news the city had fallen, but inside Madrid, the urban environment now swung fighting back in favour of the anti-fascist militias. Indeed, while reports in Ireland claimed the city had fallen by November the 6th, the advance was in fact slowing down. The spirit of resistance in the city that feared mass slaughter if it fell was summarised by the words, No passeran, they shall not pass, famously uttered by Dolores Zebraru, the leading Spanish communist known as La Pasionaria. The notion that Madrid would fall in November in that initial onslaught began to fade and the bitter fighting continued. By late November, despite horrendous losses, Madrid had survived the initial assault at least, but this was only the opening phase of a battle that would rage for months and in time would cost the lives of scores of Irish people. Indeed, back in Ireland, both sides were nearly ready to travel. Through the autumn of 1936, Ono Duffy had travelled to both London and Spain to coordinate transport of his Irish brigade. Initially, General Franco, who was emerging as dictator on the fascist side, had been hesitant about the venture. With talk of several thousand Irish people travelling, Franco was nervous about how the Irish government would react at a time where he was lobbying for international recognition and the Irish government to date had remained aloof. Eventually, it was decided that the Irish could join the Spanish Foreign Legion. There they could form their own banderas, 
units of a thousand men with Spanish liaison officers. This was a major concession to Orno Duffy. The Legion was, after all, the elite formation of the Spanish army and was far better paid. It would take weeks before a transport ship was arranged and in December, a German ship, the Domingo, arrived in Galway to take O'Duffy and his followers to the Portuguese port of Lisbon, after which they could cross into Spain easily. On December the 12th to the 13th, there was a sense of anticipation in Galway. Indeed, the atmosphere on the quayside was jubilant. Family members had turned up to wish some of the 600 volunteers well. Songs were sung. Even two priests blessed the volunteers as they set off on their so-called crusade. Meanwhile, the anti-fascists had left Dublin a few days earlier in far less jubilant circumstances. Their departure was, if anything, lonely, perhaps even tinged with bitterness. On December the 11th, 1936, 80 of them had left Ireland in three groups from the ports of Rosslare, Dublin and Belfast. There was no bands, no cheering crowds. It was, all told, a more lonely, sombre affair. Many of them had kept their departure quiet. Frank Ryan, for example, had not even told his own family. However, as he awaited a train in Dublin to bring him to the port, his sister Ailish, on hearing of his plans, had turned up to say farewell. Ryan gave her his rosary beads and, fearing what would be said about him, asked of her, Tell mother and father I'm not a red. I'm going to fight for democracy in Spain. Whatever concerns they may have had about what the future held for them can only have been heightened by the fact that they were travelling without what might be considered their natural leaders. Padre O'Donnell had judged himself too old while another prominent IRA veteran, George Gilmore, had broken his leg in a plane crash while trying to establish connections with anti-fascists in the Basque country. This left Frank Ryan the leading member, although the fact he had poor hearing undermined his suitability as a leading figure in war. Their journey out proved a lot more difficult than that of Ono Duffy's Irish Brigade who had travelled directly to Lisbon. Frank Ryan and the International Brigaders first travelled to London, where they were vetted by British communists. From there they travelled to Paris, where the French Communist Party, the largest in Western Europe, was coordinating international volunteers. However, even in Paris, they still had to hide what their ultimate destination was. Historian Anthony Beaver gives a sense of what Paris was like in these days. Paris was the marshalling yard for volunteers of all nationalities. On arrival at the Gare du Nord, Left-wing taxi drivers drove them to the reception centres in the 9th arrondissement. Almost every day, young men, brown paper parcels under their arms, could be seen waiting for the Perpignan train at the Gare d'Australitz, conspicuously trying to look inconspicuous. Once safely on the train, they would fraternise with those whose glances they had just been avoiding so studiously. Wine was passed around, food shared, and the International sung endlessly. The two principal routes were either to Marseille, where they were smuggled onto ships for Barcelona or Valencia, or else to Perpignan, and then over the Pyrenees at night. Frank Ryan and the International Brigaders took the latter of these routes, crossing the Pyrenees in mid-December. Once they were over the border, they made their way to Albacete, which had been allocated as a training centre for international anti-fascist volunteers. So it was, at Christmas 1936, two groups of Irish people, some of whom had been former members of the IRA together, were in training camps preparing to fight on opposing sides in the Spanish Civil War. Neither group had much experience of conventional warfare and were both in desperate need of training, but the two groups had a very different experience from this moment on. In Albacete, the Irish anti-fascists joined a training camp of thousands of international socialists and communists. Judging on his letters, Frank Ryan was happy at how the Irish volunteers acquitted themselves during the training. Writing to a friend, he said, You must remember that all our years in the IRA were good to purpose. These lads are well trained and will never let us down. While this indicates they were taking their training seriously and adapting well to life in Spain, there is a certain degree of naivety given what lay ahead of them. Their experiences in the IRA would only take them so far. They were soon to find out conventional warfare was very different to guerrilla warfare that they had been training for. Overall, however, their experience appears to have been positive. Perhaps for a group who had spent most of their lives on the margins of Irish society, constantly being attacked for their beliefs, it was inspiring to be among like-minded people. Furthermore, for Frank Ryan at least, it seemed that the wider public were also behind them. The people are 90% against Franco. I've been among the peasants at villages. They have enough to eat for the first time in their lives. Food and clothing are cheap and, strange to say, plentiful. Needless it goes without saying, those with fascist sympathies were unlikely to raise them with someone who'd travelled over 2,000 kilometres to fight fascism. 
However, by and large, the early reports from the anti-fascists in Spain was positive. One of the few complaints they had was the quality of cigarettes. Frank Ryan would again write to a friend saying, They are terrible, but I am always hearing they have good ones in the next town. I fear I'll never reach the next town. Now, 450 kilometres away to the west, Ona Duffy and the Irish Brigade were having a very different experience. From the outset, it was clear discipline was going to be a major problem. Not long after reaching the port of Lisbon in Portugal, members of the Irish Brigade had been involved in a quayside fracas with the Portuguese police, a foretaste of what lay ahead. Indeed, dangerous and chronic indiscipline would become a serious problem. When their training got underway in the city of Cacieras, Father Alexander McCabe, the rector of the Irish College in Salamanca, quickly heard reports of a... A drink problem. And men had grown too fond of the vino. Now, many of Aduffy's Irish volunteers were raw recruits who had never fired a gun and were in desperate need of training. Indeed, this in itself appears to have led to some tensions with the Spaniards, as O'Duffy appears to have misled them about the quality of the troops he was bringing, and indeed his own experience. Leopold Kearney, the Irish ambassador to Spain, commented, They thought originally that O'Duffy had the military experience and science of a general. They now know from conversations with him that his military knowledge is very limited. Alexander McCabe, the Irish priest who has lived in Salamanca where Franco was based, backed this up when he said, The Spanish authorities had the erroneous impression that Ireland would send out a crack regiment of veterans, perhaps of the Great War, and up to the standards of any continental army. The Spaniards thought too that all the officers would have been trained in a military academy such as they themselves. Now these problems were compounded by the fact that the volunteers did not take their training that they desperately needed very seriously. Again, the priest Alexander McCabe increasingly thought they were just a band of adventurers. He would record in his diary in February 1937, just two months after they had arrived and when their training was nearing its end, that The attendance at brothels has increased from five the first fortnight to 40 a week now. Several cafes were broken this week. The proprietor of one injured. Our name is below zero. Drunkenness is a curse. However, despite these problems, as the war intensified, the Irish, on both sides, even with their limited military experience, would soon find themselves in the heat of battle. Indeed, as most of these volunteers were starting their training, some Irish anti-fascists who had been living in London and had travelled out even earlier were already being thrown into the front line as the desperate siege of Madrid continued. There, the realities of war hit home. In mid-December, the anti-fascist Thomas Patton from Ackill Island in County Mayo was the first Irish person to die in the war when he was killed outside Madrid. A few days later, the Dublin communist Jack Blue Barry was also killed. They were the first of many. In the next episode, we will follow the Irish into battle, initially in Andalusia, and then the most deadly battle of the entire war in Irish terms, the Battle of Harama. That episode comes out on Wednesday. In the meantime, don't forget to check out the shop at irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. That's irishhistorypodcast.ie forward slash shop. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>